All right. Well, hello to all of our GC6 students and all of our members. Thank you for tuning in. This is our week nine meeting and our final meeting of the academic year. As you know, our focus this quarter has really been about exposing our members to varying specialties in general counseling. And we really try to take advantage of the pandemic situation and the virtual format to bring in genetic counselors that we would have never been able to hear from from all across the globe. And today, we are extremely fortunate to be with Dr. Anna Middleton. As a brief introduction, Dr. Middleton works not only as a genetic counselor, but serves as the head of society and ethics research at the Welcome Genome Campus in the UK, and is also a professor at the University of Cambridge. So Dr. Middleton, thank you so much for being here with us and agreeing to do this sort of recorded interview today. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself um, and then a little bit about your work? And after that, we'll get into some questions that have been posed by our members. Oh, it's lovely to be here, it really is. A um, little bit about me. Okay, so I, I do definitely feel and think of myself as a genetic counsellor, um, even though I haven't practiced clinically for probably about 15 years or so. Um, I, my, the skills of genetic counselling you can transfer to many other disciplines and I bring those skills into the research setting now so I'm very um, participant orientated I, I guess I do part, participant centred research always thinking about the communication process always um, trying to figure out how genetics makes sense for people. So I now do that in a research context as opposed to a clinical context. Um, so I started as a genetic counsellor in 1993. So I did the master's in genetic counselling programme in Manchester and worked clinically as a genetic counsellor in um, Leeds and Manchester and Cambridge. Um, so I was specialising in cancer, particularly in the latter phases of my clinical um, career. And at the beginning of my clinical career, I specialised in deafness, which is when I met Christina Palmer, because I was doing a research project looking at um, attitudes of the public towards um, prenatal testing for deafness. And I also did some work with the deaf community on that and the choices about having deaf children. So I published my first paper on that in 1998, I think it was. Um, and then did my PhD in psychology and genetics um, in, I finished in 2000, and then I've been working in an academic set setting since 2005. So yeah, sort of quite a long time mixing the two. I, I just recently stepped down as chair of the Association of Genetic Nurses and Counselors in the UK and Republic of Ireland. So that's our professional body um, that writes policy for our profession in the UK. Um, and helps to support the practice of genetic counsellors. And we're going through, as everybody is, uh, great big changes in terms of, um, you know, genomic medicine and, uh, you know, we have our National Health Service, so everybody gets access to genetic counselling for free through the National Health Service. Um, and so we've been writing job descriptions and workforce planning kind of, you know, uh, putting workforce planning uh, uh, documents together to structure how services will be delivered for patients. So loads of kind of work from a research in a clinical and policy perspective over the last I don't know, quite, quite a few years. <laughs> so I know you had a pretty big role in genetic counseling training in the UK especially. So can you talk a little bit about what that training might look like in the UK? And then if you can, maybe how that might differ from what we might see here in the US. Yes, yeah, so traditionally to, to be a genetic counsellor, you would have done a, a two year masters and then you would have done um, a period of time working as a genetic counsellor in an NHS service. And then you'd be eligible to apply for registration, which is via a portfolio, um, portfolio of work. So we, we don't have the exam system, we do something different. Uh, what we do is similar, more similar to the Australian system and South African system. So we have to demonstrate uh, competency to practice through video, through audio recordings of our consultations, um, through writing essays, uh, detailed case studies, and then documenting 50 cases um, to give details of what we've done, the information we've given, you know, photocopy records and things, of de demonstrating the uh, competency to practice. So that was always the, the model for how you become a genetic counsellor. Um, and in order to get onto the master's training, you might have done nursing before that or genetics degree, um, or you might have um, 
Anyway, there's sort of various different ways into professional, I won't go into too many details. Anyway, all of that changed uh, a few years ago um, where we still have our master's programmes, but we now have an alignment to the clinical scientist pathway. So we were never actually part of workforce planning for the NHS um, until we became officially part of their system. Um, and so we now um, have a three year uh, clinical scientist training in genetic counselling. Um, and that's attached to a, a clinical department. So you do um, a master's programme while you're working clinically and you do rotations around lots of different clinical specialities, specifically focused on genetic counselling. And then at the end of that, you're registered to be a genetic counsellor. So it's a, sh a slightly shorter process, but it's also very work-based focused. So you're getting lots of really practical experience in an IVF clinic, in a cancer clinic, in a paediatric setting, in ENT, you know, it's very, very practically focused. And then you do the masters um, sort of slightly separately, but at the same time. Um, so that's what's new for us. And it means now that the numbers can be funded from a core pot of cash from the government. Uh, so you don't now need to pay to do your genetic counseling training if you can get onto this. It's called a STP programme. Um, so you get funding to do it and then you come out hopefully with a job and a qualification if the department will keep you in the same place and you would have been funded to do the whole thing so it's it's pretty cool it sounds pretty oh. cool it sounds like a pretty yeah. <laughs> sorry you asked me about the training yes yeah, so i was on the um the core curriculum group that wrote the curriculum so we have bioinformatics in there we have the latest sort of sequencing um various interpretation clinical genetics and then there's also the counselling, all the counselling training and skills, um, psychotherapy, um, genetic counselling theory as well. So trying, trying to bring in the research that's around genetic counselling practice into the into the training. Uh, and then there's a dissertation as well that you do in it. So it's a whole lovely, lovely mix of skills that you get through the course. Yeah, very well rounded. I, mean, I, I guess in the ways I see some similarities with us as well in terms of uh, a thesis project or a capstone project uh, to make it a little bit more well-rounded, including the training and the clinical. So yeah, I see some similarities yeah. for sure. Um, I know you mentioned your work with Christina Palmer and Christina Palmer has been very integral to our organization and getting us started and off the ground. Um, how often do you get to work with genetic counselors from the US or maybe other international countries? Well, um... So over the years, many times I've interacted. Um, so Christina and I um, shared a trip to the Bro Brochet Foundation where she was, I think she was writing a book and I was writing a, a couple of papers. Um, so we've connected over the years because there's so few genetic counselors working in the deafness space, you know, it makes sense to connect. Um, and I'd also been to Gallaudet University um, to, to present my work before I met Christina, actually, so I'd connected with Kathy Arnos and the genetic counselors at Gallaudet in Washington before then. Barb Biesecker, I know really well, have worked with um, many times over the years. Um, and also we run the World Congress on Genetic Counseling in Cambridge. Um, and on the steering group at the moment, we've got Janine Austin. I know she's on, in Vancouver, but I know she's been very heavily involved in the NSGC. Um, there's the Transnational Alliance of Genetic Counselors, which got going a few years ago, and I was very heavily involved with that. That had a very international flavour. Um, I would say that we, we connect perhaps more with other countries' genetic counselors than we do with the US. Um, we have a lot of exchange with the Australian team of genetic counselors and New Zealand, South Africa. Um, and then more recently, um, you know, sharing the platform with uh, the Indian Board of Genetic Counselors, you know, at various conferences, we have them on our steering group for the World Congress. So this, yeah, I mean, I was involved on the, I sat on the Genetic Counseling Registration Board for, for several years as vice chair. And as part of that, we were looking at licensure, um, certification and registration we call it registration you call it certification um but how that fits around the world and what the standards are um and so that took me into meeting lots of genetic counselors from overseas and also we have the european board of genetic counseling as well um so they uh, regulate the profession across europe and we're closely linked in with that too so um so perhaps less so usa but more so the rest of the world maybe <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, that sounds pretty good, but it's, it's really good that there's a lot of like, you know, collaboration among all these different nations and some of these organizations organizations you're talking about sound really beneficial. So 
Yeah. Um, those sorts of collaborations, collaborations very beneficial. Um, the next question, as more population genomic projects are being proposed and carried out, what are some of the ethical challenges that you think we're gonna start facing um, in this field? So when you say population genetic programs, what do you mean in the public health setting as in um, screening? I, yeah, I'm gonna say screening um, and maybe in terms of maybe more precision medicine as well. Mm. Well, I can tell you a very, about a very specific issue that we're dealing with in the National Health Service at the moment. Um, and that's the, so the National Health Service covers the whole of the UK and all the care, whatever you need is free. And the access to genetic service is absolutely outstanding. I mean, it's really cutting edge what, what you can get. as much testing and testing of family and screening that you need. Um, but so we're, I don't know, one of the first countries, I think, in the world to introduce across the whole country um, newborn sequencing. Um, so for all newborn babies. So this is not just um, babies that are very seriously ill and they're in NICU or PICU or SCABU, any of the special care baby units. Um, so, yeah, so introducing whole newborn sequencing fraught with ethical issues, um, you know, in terms of picking up potentially, well, first, first question is what are you actually looking at? What are you testing for? You're doing the sequence and you're using it as a resource to help diagnostics in the future, to help prevention, you know, in the future, but at that moment in time, what are you going to be looking at? You know, is it adult onset conditions? How much information are you going to be giving to parents? What does consent look like? Um, so that's, so we're going through that at the moment. Um, so the ethical issues there are really at the fore, but I would always say that in terms of ethics and genetics, and they go hand in hand, they always have done, um, you know, because of our eugenic history, we're obviously, you know, very, very sensitive to that. And the genetic counseling profession was set up as an antidote to that dreadful history. But one of the core ethical issues that's always there is who, you know, whose right to information, who does this result belong to um, in terms of individual family ownership, um, control, consent, autonomy, um, jostling between the individual relatives, close relatives, parents, children. So that, I mean, that will keep us going forever, won't it, in terms of ethics. You can apply that in the public health setting, you can apply that in the clinic, you can apply that in terms of uh, consent and privacy and discrimination in the policy setting. Um, so I'd, I'd say as a very broad brush answer to your question, that's the key for me. Yeah, there's a lot of different aspects of this. You can look at it and just like you said, you can keep going on and on with a lot of the ethical issues. Um, another question that was being asked, um, and they pointed out that it can be challenging to set restrictions or regulations in terms of these ethical situations. So how do you manage dealing with these issues while still keeping in mind that central idea of patient autonomy? Um, well, I think that's a really good question. I mean, if, if we're dealing with ethics in the clinical setting, um, then the question is more easily tackled by exploring through counselling and through talking and through communication, because there's no binary, you know, single <laughs> right answer. It, it's, it's very difficult to be black and white because we've got lots of different perspectives. So we'd be unpicking that through communication. Um, in terms of um, spreading out to society and governance and regulatory frameworks and law, um, you know, that's, that's quite, <laughs> quite a detached sort of position really, isn't it? And, you know, I feel very grateful that, that you know, in the Western world's, you know, decisions are often, you're able to keep them within the confines of the, the consultation. Um, I mean, in the UK, we are very liberal in terms of our, I'd say liberal, but I think realistic in terms of our abortion laws and things. And so, you know, if couples do need to end pregnancies for a genetic abnormality, um, there isn't the stigma and discrimination attached to that as there is in other countries. And so we, there's an awful lot of support um, for couples to make the decision, the decision that feels right for them and they don't have the legal restrictions if it's for a genetic abnormality to make certain decisions by certain points for pregnancy. Um, so I feel very fortunate that we are in a system that allows 
um, autonomy to be really flourished and stretched and um, focused on individual decision making. Does that answer yeah, your question? I mean, I yeah, a bit... yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I know you brought up some, you know, abortion issues, and I, I know that's definitely a very central topic here in the United States, and that has a very big role in how genetic counselors, you know, sort of approach some of their patients and some of the difficult decision making. And there is that a lot of stigma behind it too. So that I know, at least here in the U.S., has become a very key part in the counseling session. So it's very interesting to hear how you guys in the United Kingdom are doing it a little, just a little bit differently, and how the public perception of it is is just shifted just a little bit and that can make all the difference in terms of the session you know um the next question in recent years you and several colleagues including jonathan roberts worked together to make an introductory course on genetic counseling through the website future learn um this was a course i took myself actually so it was very interesting and i noticed over ten thousand people now have enrolled in the course um, so can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you guys to get started with that project and some of the key things that maybe you guys took away from it? Oh, that's so lovely that you did the course. How exciting. That's so exciting for me because, um, you know, we, we see the participants in the course through their comments, but we don't meet them, which is obviously yeah. so different from other areas of teaching. Oh, that's lovely. So what inspired the course? Um, well, um, so... You know, I'm very, I feel very, very fortunate as a genetic counsellor to be working inside the Welcome Sanger Institute. So the organisation I belong to is called Welcome Connecting Science and we're the partner organisation to the Sanger. So the Sanger is where, you know, the magic happens in terms of large scale genomic research. It's where Sanger sequencing was discovered. It's um, the, the largest contribution from a single site to the Human Genome Project came from the Sanger Institute. So it's, you know, 2000 scientists there. And uh, when I joined, I was the only genetic counsellor and the only psychologist, social scientist, and now we have a group of 10 of us. Um, so I feel really privileged to, to have a platform where I can talk about genetic counselling and patient perspectives amongst scientists. Um, and we have incredible conferencing facilities and access to support to run courses. And so I thought, well, you know, let's make the most of that because most of the courses that they, that they run are for scientists on, you know, bioinforma uh, bioinformatics and variant interpretation and microbiology and things. And, and so I went to them and said, you know, there's a whole there's a whole audience out there that are really keen to understand what genetic counselling is. And it can be very helpful for people thinking about it as a career before they apply for courses and things. Um, and so the, you know, the courses and conferences team are very supportive. Um, I like the Future Learn platform because it's got that social learning thing where most of the learning happens between the, they call them the learners, they're not students, they're the learners interacting with each other. Um, and we had a lot of fun making the films as well that sit in it um, and also connecting with our wonderful collaborators around the world. So genetic counselling counsellors in South Africa and Russia and, you know, India and places all took part. So, um, yeah, I'm really pleased you liked it. It's, it's a great course. Yeah, 10,000. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was a great course. And I really enjoyed how, how introductory it was, because when I took it, it was at a time when I was, I had known about genetic counselling, um, but I was still at the early phases of it. So getting to hear a lot of the introductory stuff, a lot of the key terms, a lot of the key practices, um, it, it was just a, such a great, well-rounded introductory course. And um, if it does, I don't think enrollment is open right now, but if it does ever come back into enrollment, I highly recommend anyone else do it. And I know you had said that there's a big demand for it. And I think especially yeah. among prospective genetic counseling students, but also it's it's a relatively short course that a lot of clinicians and physicians might get a lot of benefit out of it too, as they start to incorporate more genetic services into their practice. So. The course yeah, it runs itself every is year. really enjoyable. Oh, good. I'm so that's lovely feedback. Thank you. Yeah, it runs every year. So in January, it, it runs every oh, year. Perfect. Um, yeah, so it, it's there. If you just look up future learn genetic counseling, you'll find it. Yeah, I hope that's going to be something that when we can start sharing with some of our members and mm. maybe boost it just a little bit more. I thought it was a really great course. Well, actually, funnily enough, the students that applied to Cambridge, uh, not Cambridge, Cardiff and Manchester, so our two master's courses in the UK, they, they're encouraged to do the course before they apply, just oh, really? so, they, <laughs> so they know what's coming up, yeah. <laughs> it's a perfect, perfect transition and a perfect introduction. 
Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about your involvement with the deaf community. And um, I know you've said that one of your proudest achievements was publishing your data on those attitudes towards prenatal testing. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the more memorable experiences or some of the lessons you took away from those projects? Yeah, that, that piece of work ha has had a profound impact on me um, and I feel so fortunate to have had it. So when I finished doing my master's training in genetic counselling, um, there weren't very many jobs around and there was a real pr um, pressure to you know, join a genetics department and start seeing patients immediately. Um, and there were just very few jobs. So one of the only jobs that I could see coming up was, was working, actually it was on uh, what we now know is the Connexin 26 gene. Um, we didn't know then. This is when all the first genes for deafness were, were starting to be discovered. And so I was asked to, um, uh, you know, so my first job was a research job and um, collecting recessive deafness families for the research to try and discover the first gene for deafness. And of course, now we know there are hundreds of them. This was the first one. Um, and I went merrily off, completely and utterly naively, into families' homes. Um, to take blood and explain why we were doing this research and just immediately hit a brick wall um, because I met the deaf community, you know, out there. Um, of course, completely positive and proud to be deaf um, with many generations of deafness. And, you know, I, I met, you know, even with recessive deafness where there was everybody in the family was deaf. Um, and you know, sort of challenging me, what on earth are you doing? You know, of course, I was very, very junior genetic cancer at the time and um, hadn't experienced, I thought everybody would be positive about this. And I thought this, nobody in science really knows that this, this, this really strong feeling about how negative this is, is there. So um, I merrily collected my samples and did a lot of talking about, you know, why I would want to understand deafness more from a genetic point of view, and then thought, no, I need to go and do a PhD on this. So that's when I decided to go and focus full time on that and really immerse myself in deaf community and learn sign language and went to deaf. Uh, it, was, it was just, it was so interesting, went to deaf conferences. So um, I went to the conference called the Deaf Nations um, and I was the only white hearing um, genetics female in the audience so it was mostly um, I was just such an outsider from many different perspectives and I was shunned at coffee time nobody would talk to me um, and I was in, in sign language that's in British sign language that's the sign for bad so I was the bad genetics lady um, it was so interesting it was so good to feel that level of discrimination and that level of pain about genetics uh, yeah, really, really opened my eyes up to um, diversity issues from many different angles. And um, that's been the cornerstone of all of my research moving forward. It's been diversity and equity and access and equality in virtually everything I've ever done since. It had quite an impact. But yeah, I really, I really enjoyed um, gathering these views and, and just seeing the experience of, of how positive it was to be deaf for, for some families, you know, where such a rich, exciting culture and going to the deaf club on a Friday night and having a beer with local people and signing and, you know, just getting into the culture was just so interesting. Um, and I just felt, you know, this is a, a group that could really um, benefit from genetic counselling for cancer, for cystic fibrosis, for all sorts of other things that they're not accessing at the moment because they're so terrified that we tell them that they shouldn't or can't have children in case they pass deafness on. And so I then moved forward in my research, started exploring access issues as to why certain groups don't access genetic counselling and the, and the fears that they come to that with misconceived you know, ideas about what happens in genetic counselling. Um, yeah, so I'd say that it is one of my proudest moments because actually in the field, there was so little awareness then, so we're talking about the mid nineties, um, about the deaf culture within genetics. People automatically assumed we should find the deaf gene, um, the deaf gene, and we should use it to get rid of deafness. Um, and we know that it's so, much, it's so much richer than that. You know, this is about choice. Um, this is about, um, yeah, people making choices that are right for them. Anyway, that research did contribute to finding the Connexin 26 gene, so that was exciting. So that was my first paper. <laughs> oh, wow. Perfect. 
Um, I have two follow-up questions to that. Um, my first follow-up question is, do you think some of those negative attitudes are still something that we might see today? Or do you think that's something that has changed a little bit since then? Um, no, I mean, you mean from the deaf community? You think there's yes. like, yeah, yeah, no, they're still definitely there. And, um, you know, the, yes, they're very much still there. And it, it kind of depends. I mean, Christina would be a good person to talk to about this, um, what the latest is in terms of access. So in places where there are really good services for deaf people, where you have um, sign language users and, you know, you're making all of the resources and materials available in sign language and you're uh, very public and out there in your messaging and, and how open you are, you know, in terms of diversity. Yes, yeah, services are great. Um, but still, we don't have that in the majority still. Um, and deaf awareness is very poor still, sadly. And um, I mean, even so we've got deaf community and, you know, complete profound congenital hearing loss at one end. And then the other end, we've got mild you know, hearing impairment. Um, and the majority of us at some point as we get older will, will have some level of hearing impairment. Even just managing that in society is not where it should be. You know, you go to a hospital uh, and you go to have bloods taken and the person calls out your name in the waiting room and you can't hear them. And they're not even making that accessible in terms of, you know, audio and good lip reading and all, you know, just that thinking about um, access is just not very good <laughs> across society. So a long way to go. Right. And then uh, my second question, whether it be the in, more in the deaf community or other maybe vulnerable communities or communities that maybe don't have a strong trust in science and genetics, how might we best bridge some of those gaps and kind of bring down some of the stigma that might still be associated with genetics and genetic testing? Well, You've actually hit the nail on the head on what our current research is on. Um, so I love, I love that. Um, yeah. So, how do you engage disengaged communities and people who mistrust what you do, or are frightened, or just don't care? Um, and you know, some empirical research suggests that around seventy percent of our population in the UK. Um, mistrust and don't care what genetics is. So the rest have either heard of it, maybe they've had a 23andMe test, or maybe they've um, taken part in some kind of biobank or research study, and, or maybe they've even got a family history of something. So they're orientated a little bit to the terminology. They've, they've clued in a little bit to what genetics is. They don't need to know about any of the scientific terms, but they do know that DNA and genetics are things that run in families. And that's really all you need to know. Um, but yeah, there's this other very, very large, very, very disconnected audience. Um, and and where there's great big calls in policy all around the world about how we need to educate the public, how we need to engage the public, how we need to do something to them, which is very deficit model. It's like they're missing something. So let's fill them with information and then it'll be great. Everyone will know what's going on. And we know that deficit models don't work. They don't work. Who's interested in, in knowing what a pathogenic variant is unless they've got some orientation as to why they even need to care so we're, we're doing work at the moment on how do you build that bridge um, before you even start talking about genetics what is your conversation starter what's the evidence base behind the conversation starter and we're exploring framing framings and tropes and memes and metaphors around altruism you know if if you donate your data then that will uh, do good for humankind because it helps in terms of um, health research about genetics and environment so it could be altruism you could be helping your family is it about solidarity is it about sticking together we need to be in this together and I think COVID's given us lots of clues that people are up for solidarity and that might be a, a kind of way in and actually also COVID and the pandemic has brought into normal everyday conversations variants you know people who've never heard of what genomics is uh, have now heard of variants um, so it's about using creative methods to figure out the evidence base behind the communication and so we're working with advertisers and storytellers and um, people from the marketing industry who are really good storytellers to work out 
what, what, what's the emotional connection that you need to make before you can then have a conversation where you can take them into the science and then don't go too heavy on the science has always been my method <laughs> so you know we, we often fall back on saying oh you know dna has got spelling mistakes in genes and uh, or genes are like recipe books or libraries or whatever and we use these metaphors there's no evidence base behind them actually working or resonating for people and particularly the spelling mistake one relies people on knowing that DNA is made up of letters, you know, and people don't know that. So, um, you know, you have to sort of try and unpick the metaphors and think, think more about how they use. We're using the metaphor of music at the moment in, in the clinical setting um, to describe genetics. So if you think about music, music can be inherited in families, it crosses generations, it's, you know, different diverse groups have different music they like, you could imagine changing a, a few notes in a song and it could change how the song sounds, you know, you can start to overlay genetics into it. Um, yeah, so we're trialling those in genetic cats in clinics at the moment and seeing how, how they work out and we've made some films that genetic cats are showing in clinic and we're getting ratings from patients on them. That's such an interesting metaphor. It's something I personally would have never thought of, but the way you explain it, it makes perfect sense how that would totally translate to genetics. Yeah, we can all relate to it. Even, even the deaf community has their right. own. Mm. So some of those preliminary, I know you said it's in trials and stuff like that, but uh, preliminarily, has that seemed pretty effective and pretty well it's received? So interesting. It's so interesting. So in a, in a clinical setting, in a hospital setting, you're used to, as a, as a patient, I'm speaking for myself as a patient, you're used to having information delivered to you in a certain way. And having a quirky little film that describes genetics using music is very, very creative. So it either jars in a good way, some people absolutely love it, or it jars in a, in a negative way. So we, at the moment, we, we're seeing quite a few okay. extremes. So it may well be that actually in the counselling session is not the place for these films. It might be that they go with a post-clinic letter, perhaps, or they go on the website that people can check out before and after a consultation. I don't know, but we're, we're also interested in, does it interrupt the counselling process as well? We've had mixed feedback on that. So some people really like turning to look at an iPad and focus together with the counsellor on a film when you have that shared experience. I also also takes the pressure off a little bit if you're in a heightened moment and others have found it, it it disrupts things too much so we're kind of interested in well this is what research is isn't it it's trying to find something new evidence base yeah that's so interesting and I, I i definitely feel like that's going to be something i'm going to want to look more into in the future and mm. see how that goes so that's really very interesting cool um, the next question, how do you see the field of genetic counseling changing in the next five to 10 years, whether that's in your home area or internationally? Oh, goodness. Well, I see where it is changing. I don't know if it's necessarily the right direction. Um, so we're in the UK, we're particularly focused on this term mainstreaming at the moment, which uh, I also learned is not really used too much outside of the UK. But this is where genetics is being utilized in every discipline across medicine. Um, so it's gone mainstream, it's gone, it's left specialist clinical genetic services. Um, and so um, everybody in the National Health Service, and we have the um, you know, the challenging task of upskilling every health professional to some degree in genetics. Um, and that is, a, is an incredible task, given that people often see genetics as very complicated, not for them, they didn't enjoy it at school or, you know, in their medical degrees or whatever, they don't see the relevance of it. Um, so there's, yeah, I, I see where genetic counselling going is, and this, I think this is a good thing, is supporting mainstream healthcare professionals to upskill and, help, and support them and run clinics alongside them and be an advocate for them and help you know, them to translate genetics into their everyday working practices. So that's in a health clinical setting where you're dealing with ill people. I, mean, I think that's great. However, genetic counsellors are also being drawn into, um, you know, testing for athletic ability and the direct to consumer testing market and uh, nutrigenomics and all of that. Um, and I just think that's not a good use of their skills because there's so few of us there's only seven thousand of us around the world um to be lured into that area 
um, of practice where the evidence base is very low and the impact on you know serious life-threatening conditions is it's just a different focus anyway so but I see I'm seeing a lot of adverts at the moment for genetic counselors in these really well-paid positions in these companies doing crazy things that have very little evidence base behind them yeah do you think some of those direct-to-consumer companies maybe like 23andme or even um to a level ancestry.com do you think those are facilitating that negative shift or maybe bringing on some of those yeah. maybe not so easy conversations and what are your yeah, thoughts yeah then they're not regulated i mean certainly in the uk they're not regulated and <clears throat> i was part of a um, science and technology select committee so this is where our government well actually it was across all the different parties um, in parliament had a call on how do we regulate the direct to consumer testing market and what are the standards that they need to adhere to to be able to function in the uk um, and the companies they all want genetic counselors to join them um, but you know at the same time they're not giving genetic counselors really senior positions you know decision making positions what they're what they're after is genetic counselors to pick up the pieces in terms of the conversation about results that's, that's not where genetic counselors should be sitting. They should be sitting at board level and directing where these companies are um, investing their research, you know, their partnerships and collaborations with industry, bringing ethics into all of that, you know, and having the patient and all the participant at the heart of everything. Um, they, they are a worry. And actually in the UK, what they're doing is not ethical at all. So um, when you go through all of their testing and you get your report and in the UK, it says, if you have any concerns about this, go and talk to a genetic counsellor. And of course, you can't do that in the UK just by phoning up a genetic counsellor. You have to go through the NHS and the referral systems to do that. And so what 23andMe have done is they've put on their website a link to the um, the British Society of Genetics and Medicine, which is one of our professional bodies, you can't reach a genetic counsellor through them. You know, they, they do with membership inquiries and conferences and, you know, sending out leaflets as to what, you know, <laughs> meetings are coming up. You can't find the genetic counsellor there. But 23andMe still have that on their website as a way to reach a genetic counsellor. Um, it's unethical, it's wrong, it's misleading their customers. So they're waiting for someone else to pick up the pieces. That's not ethical. Yeah, you know, we see pretty much that same thing here in the United States where it, it'll give you that prompt, oh, contact a genetic counselor if you have any of these concerns. And it's the same thing here where you can't just call a genetic counselor. You can't just walk into a clinic and see it. There's a lot of steps mm -hmm. behind it. So I, I guess definitely a lot more that needs to be done with the direct consumer market and trying to bring back some of, uh, I, I definitely feel like it's taken away from maybe what it was intended to do. Um, and kind of start to reel that back in. Um, the last question, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? No, I was gonna say, well, of course their business model originally was to cut out, yeah. that's what that was like, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. great direct to consumer, you know, you, no, yeah. no people in the way, so yeah. It's... Yeah, you have that, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, the last question, what advice do you have for someone thinking about pursuing genetic counseling or someone who already knows that this is what they want to do and they want to continue on that path? So I'd say if you um, enjoy working with people and you enjoy the science, then keep going. <laughs> if you want to get on the courses and you're not getting on, <clears throat> keep trying and also think internationally because there are courses now, you know, virtually in every country around the world. They're very difficult to get into. Having said that, you know, we often have about 2000 applications for one place um, in the oh. UK. So, yeah, they're really, really competitive. But um, it's about, you know, if that's your passion is, is keep going and keep applying. Um, but also, I'd, I'd, I think when you do the master's course, you often think, um, you know, you have a very clear idea. I want to work in a clinical setting. I want to work with this type of patient. They want to work in this type of place and I, I would um, don't worry about any of that because you have such transferable skills that you could really work in any industry. I mean I know genetic counsellors who've gone into publishing for example or who've gone into education or into policy or into business or into you know research like I have, research in many different settings. Um, I think your ability to 
communicate well, which is one of the things that you learn on the master's course, um, is what can stand you in really good stead. And I've actually found I use um, I use the internal supervisor in my head, which I learned through doing the master's program, also practicing clinically. I use that with my scientist colleagues every day. Um, I'm thinking about transference and counter-transference. I'm thinking about psychodynamics. I'm thinking about nonverbal body language in pretty much every interaction I have with everybody. So um, it doesn't need to have a genetics conversation in it, but it's so transferable. Um, and being able to listen, clearly a good skill in life, <laughs> in any in the line of business. But I think it's a very exciting time to be a chest counselor because we are very in demand, which is great. <laughs> definitely. And I, I definitely can speak for myself for over the last couple of years. I've been involved with the student interest group for uh, I think this is my third year and every year we've seen a growth in membership or a growth in interest so definitely an exciting time to be a general counselor and there's a lot of opportunity out there yeah and it's been like that for year on year out year on year out you know for the last 20 right. years so it's still increasing yep very encouraging and I know if to us involved it's very encouraging to see so many people coming towards it. I know in the United States there's in this past year alone a plethora of new programs being added to the being added to the list so just to see that growth it's very encouraging and i know it's only going to continue going up from here mm. all right well that is all i have so dr middleton thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me today and for answering some of our questions like i said i know our members are going to be extremely grateful for your time and for some of your expertise in these different fields so thank you so much for meeting with me Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for contacting me. It's really nice to talk to you and good luck with everything. Thank you. Uh, best of luck to all of your ongoing research. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. You. Hopefully yeah. see you around in the future. Yeah, yeah. Come to the World Congress on Genetic Counseling. It's virtual this year, so. Ah, even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just dial in. And it's going to be really international. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. So oh, just just kidding. World Congress on Genetic Counseling 2021 Cambridge and you'll find it. <laughs> Definitely will. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. All right. Goodbye.